Good morning. We're going to be in Psalm 101 this morning. Psalm 101. And the title of our sermon this morning is The Work of Those Who Fall Away. Psalm 101, verse number one. I will sing of mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when you will come to me, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. I don't know about you, but spring, spring forward is something that I enjoy much more than falling back. Now, falling back on the first day, of course, is, is very wonderful because we get an extra hour of sleep in the morning. And I have always thought if we were ever to all be here on time on any Sunday that today would be the day. However, we know that there's some drawbacks about this idea of falling back, and we know that it gets dark much earlier now than what it did uh, several weeks ago as we're making our way into fall and eventually the winter. But it is a pretty good thing that we had an extra hour of sleep last night because we all, I know all of us, stayed up all the way, even into overtime, to see our LSU Tigers be victorious over those Alabama something and something over there in Tuscaloosa. And what we know is that, yes, this is Saint Sunday, but we are very excited that our LSU Tigers have won. But did you notice that Jarrett Lee was falling back into his own uh, ways? Now, I'll have to tell you, I do have a soft heart for Jordan Jefferson, and I was pulling for him and very thankful that he got another opportunity being fellow Destrahan uh, graduates. But Jarrett Lee, he, before last night, had not thrown an interception in over a hundred attempts, but last night he fell back into those old ways. Of course, not intentionally, but it was reminded of a few games a year or two ago in which many interceptions were thrown. But as Christians this morning, as we begin, we want to make sure that none of us fall back into living a sinful life. Life. We know, of course, what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But as Christians, we know that we have been justified, as verse 24 says, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This morning, we are going to be talking about falling away and falling back. But at front, we want to remind all of us as Christians that we want to continue living faithfully and never get back, whether unintentionally or unintentionally, never fall back into that old way of living, that life that we lived before we became Christians. Now, the phrase fall back or or falling back does not appear in the New Testament or in the Old Testament for that matter. But there are several passages of Scripture 
that talk about falling, either falling down or even more importantly, falling away. And it's some of these scriptures that I would like to notice with you this morning as we ask the question, what does the Bible say about falling away? Will you go with me in your New Testament to the book of Matthew chapter 15. We'll thumb through several passages this morning as we are asking this question. What does the Bible say about falling away? In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is teaching quite a bit uh, as he does throughout the gospel. And he says in verse number 16 of Matthew 15, I'm sorry, verse number 13, he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. What we need to know is if we are not following after Christ and we're following any other teaching or tradition, if we as blind are following the blind, we will fall. And I would imagine falling into a ditch will hurt pretty bad. Over in the Gospel of Luke chapter 8, verse number 13, more is said about falling. Jesus is teaching on the parable of the soils, and we know there are several several different types of soil, and we want to be a part of that soil that is good, that is able, the seed is able to be planted, and it grows to be strong. But notice what verse number 13 says in Luke chapter 8. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. We certainly don't want to be like this rocky soil that has no root, that it seems like things are going pretty good for a little while, but for one reason or another, specifically here, temptation, the seed is not able to produce into a good crop. And I know you're familiar with the, what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 about falling away. This is the Apostle Paul writing. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. And the very verse after that says, No temptation has overtaken you except such that is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, there will also be the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The bad news is, as Christians, we can fall away, and we do need to take heed lest we fall. But the good news is, is that God is faithful, and he will never put us in a situation in which we can say, well, we had no control over that temptation because we were, it was something that we could not handle. Moving right along in your New Testament, Galatians chapter 5. As we ask the question, what does the Bible say about falling away? Paul writes again, you have become estranged from Christ. You who are to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. What grace? Well, it's that grace that we've all been justified freely by. Yes, we notice in Romans 3, we are all sinners and we do fall short of the glory of God, but we have been justified freely by His grace. But did you know that as a child of God, as a Christian who has been justified, you can fall from grace? Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, more is said about falling away. 
In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul is talking about how at one point in time there will be a large falling away, and we know that many people have fallen away from God. Throughout history, many have fallen away from truth and are not living the Christian life. Finally, over in Second Peter chapter 2, as we are looking up front at some verses that teach us about the possibility of Christians falling away. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse number 20. For if they, rather for if after they, have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ... They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But as it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a so having washed, to her wallowing in the mirror. And notice chapter 3, same book, 2 Peter 3, same chapter, 2 Peter 3, verse number 17. You therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory, both now and forever. These verses here, what are you saying to us, Peter, being inspired by the Holy Spirit? Peter is saying that, yes, it is possible to escape the pollutions of the world, those nasty, stinky, disgusting things of the world. It's possible to escape that and become Christians, but at the same time, In the same way that dogs return to their vomit, we as Christians can, if we allow ourselves, fall back into that polluted way of living. And that is why Peter encourages us in chapter 3 to be steadfast and to grow in the grace and the knowledge. Why, Peter, do we need to grow in the grace and knowledge and why do we need to be steadfast? And so we do not become like that dog that returns to his vomit so that we do not fall away as Christians back into the pollutions of the world. But did you know that despite what these verses say, and they're very clear in the New Testament, that many people out there today hold the belief that once you are saved, you are always saved. Saved. In a similar way, you might hear it said to the point that once you become a Christian, there is nothing you can do to lose or forfeit your salvation. There are a lot of people that truly believe that way. But there are several dangers or cautions that need to be mentioned associated with this doctrine of once saved, always saved. Five reasons. Number one, most of the people who teach it are not saved to begin with. This is a teaching that a lot of folks have in the, in the denominational world. And many people that are advocating this have not truly obeyed the gospel, truly repented of sins, confessed faith, and have been immersed for the remission of those sins. A second danger is that this doctrine of once saved, always saved, gives a false sense of security to those who are 
Christians. Because if we're working from the mentality that there is nothing that we can do to lose our salvation, we can have the thought, well, I can live however I want, yet still be able to go to heaven. And this false sense of security tells us that, well, it doesn't matter how I live my life. A third danger associated with this doctrine is, of course, that it discourages Christian growth. We just noticed here in Second Peter 3 how he is encouraging the people to grow, to be steadfast. But if we're working from the presumption that, well, it doesn't matter what we do, once you're saved, you're always saved, then why do we spend any time in prayer and growing and reading and fellowship and worship? Item number four, a fourth danger associated with this belief, this false belief of once saved, always saved, is that us resisting temptation is far less likely. Again, working from this notion, it doesn't matter what I do because I'll always be a Christian. Then that tells me, well, whenever the temptation comes, I can go ahead and partake in that sin because I'm going to be saved anyway. And then fifth and finally, and most importantly, the dangers with this belief of once you're saved, you're always saved, is that it goes against specific Bible teachings in our New Testament. Again, these teachings in New Testament, Jesus says the blind will lead the blind and they'll, they'll fall into the ditch. Over in Luke chapter 8, we know that the rocky soil, it will at first it will be good, but then it will fall away. 1 Corinthians 10, take heed lest you fall. Galatians chapter 5, for you were saved, but watch out because you may fall from grace. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, there will be a big falling away. In Second Peter 2 and, cha- and then chapter 3, the dog returns to their vomit and we need to be steadfast and movable. The Bible clearly teaches that it is possible for a Christian to fall away from God. And so now that we've asked that question and have answered it with Scripture, Let's move on this morning and now ask the question, what can I do to avoid falling away? Or how can I make sure that I do not fall away from God and fall away from the truth of the gospel? And it's at this point that we go back to Psalm 101 as we look at some things that David had in mind as he was living his life of faith. I do realize this is a part of the old covenant, but what we see here are some principles, and we'll connect them to New Testament teaching, that we see some principles that are evident in the life of David. Now, we do not know exactly when David is writing this psalm, and But what we can conclude is that it was probably after his downfall with Bathsheba and it was, knowing that that had occurred several writings back uh, in Psalm 55, and give or take a couple of chapters. But now we're in Psalm 101 and David is writing on a very personal level and he is writing as king of Israel, but he is also writing as man of God, a, a friend of God, a man after God's own heart. So as we ask the question, how can we avoid falling away? In each of these, there's four of them. We'll begin with the letter W. How can we avoid a falling away? First, this morning, as we look again at verse number one, we need to make sure we worship. Worship is connected with not falling away. Notice again what David is saying and what he is doing in verse number one of Psalm 101. I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. As Christians, we come together to worship, to sing praises to our God. And we're speaking or singing of his mercy, of his justice, that we have been able to be freed from this sin as Christ has delivered us through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
there is a positive correlation between those things considered as worship and those things considered as faithfulness. You may say, Eric, well, what do you mean by correlation? Well, those of you that like math or like statistics, you know what a correlation is. It, it means that two items are similar, that they are related to one another. For example, if you want to go to college, you probably have to take the ACT or the SAT. You say, well, why do I need to take this standardized test? Well, because high scores on the SAT or the ACT are correlated with high GPA scores in college. And so these admissions folks, if they're trying to figure out if they're going to let you into their program, they are going to look at your standardized score and try to predict how well you will do in college. Well, did you know that worship and faithfulness are correlated as well? Because the more and more you worship, the more and more you will be faithful. There is a positive correlation or said in the negative sense, those that the, or rather the more and more you skip worship, the more and more you will fall away. These items are related to one another. The Bible does say in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, in theory, as Christians, we would not need the commandment to worship. Because we being saved by the grace of God, we having forgiveness of our sins, knowing that God has loved us, he has saved us, and he has promised us heaven, then we should want to worship him naturally. And it's not the idea that I got to go to church, but I get to go to church. And it's something we look forward to, to say, thank you, God, as we sing praises to him, recognizing that he has given us mercy and he has given us justice. But just in case that natural motivation either is not there or is minimized, we do have the command not to uh, forsake the assembly. We do have the command to come together to worship our God. In Psalm 101, we're asking the question, how can we avoid falling away? David is teaching us through his example as a man after God's own heart. And we see in verse number one that we are to, have, we are to worship But as we look at verse number two, secondly, we are to have wisdom as well. Notice what David is saying in verse two. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Or your translation may say, I will behave wisely in a blameless way. As Christians, we want to have wisdom And we want that wisdom to be based upon God's word, truth, and that wisdom based upon our faithfulness and our years of experience as living the Christian life. And those of you in the Tuesday morning class are well aware that we're studying Ecclesiastes and we've come been, we've been contrasting life under the sun as a, as a metaphor for worldly wisdom as opposed to wisdom from above. And we know that as Christians, we don't want to follow the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of media or any of those items. But rather, we want to follow after the wisdom of God. The Bible says in James chapter 3, verse number 17, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. How are we going to be able to be wise? What does that look like then when our lives are full of godly wisdom? Well, we're going to be peaceable people. We're going to be gentle. We're not going to snap or we're not going to fight. We are going to be people that are full of mercy. We're, we're going to let some people go on some things. We're going to ease up 
a little bit. We're going to be filled with good fruits or good works. We're going to be looking for opportunities to help out other people. And we by no means are going to be uh, hypocrites in the church. This is what James is teaching us as far as living the wise Christian life. And so as we're looking at ways to increase our wisdom, how can we do that? Well, it begins by studying the word. It begins by reading our Bibles. Hopefully we're reading our Bibles every day. And hopefully we're taking advantage of the the Bible classes that are offered here for adults and for your children to learn more knowledge so that knowledge can eventually be put into practice and will become godly wisdom. Third, this morning, as we are asking the question, how can I avoid falling away from God? We want to make sure we worship. We want to make sure we have wisdom. And number three, we want to make sure we are walking after God. In verse number two, the last part of it, David writes, I will walk within my house with a peaceful heart. He says again in verse number six, he who walks in a perfect way. He shall serve me. He who walks, maybe your translation says, in a blameless way. And so as we are walking after God or walking towards God, we are following after what is being taught. Now, we won't expound upon this point much because in recent sermons, we've talked about walking with God. We looked at Enoch and how he walked with God. And we noticed the passage over in 1 John 1 about the importance as walking in the light. But I'm reminded of what the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse number 6. And this reference about Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. The Bible says, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They are walking, following after God, living blameless lives, living perfect lives in the sense of complete or blameless. And they are doing everything they can to follow after God's will. And fourth and finally this morning, as we consider the text in 101, Psalm 101, and we're asking the question, how can I avoid falling away? I'll tell you up front, this is a double negative. How can I avoid falling away while we avoid wickedness? I realize that's a double negative, but avoiding falling away by avoiding wickedness is a positive thing that you can do in your life. Notice again verses, verse number three. David says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. How can I avoid wickedness? Well, we pay attention to the things that we are looking at, either in real life or in fantasy life on the computer. How else do we avoid wickedness? Well, we make sure that we have, that we do not have a perverse heart. Like verse number four says, the perverse hearts, they will depart from me. We talked last week about making sure our spiritual hearts are right with God. Verse number five, David, how do I avoid weak wickedness? Well, we do not secretly slander our neighbors. Now, I know that sounds like very strong language, and it is. But what we say about our Christian friends and our brothers and sisters and and those outside of Christ, everyone who is different than us, we do not need to secretly slander them. Some people like to think of it as you love me to my face, but you hate me behind my back. That's what secretly slandering is about. And David is mindful that if we're doing things like that, then we are going to be a part of those who fall away. There is more said in the, in this chapter. Look at verse number seven. What do wicked people do? Well, they have deceit. And at the end of verse number seven, wicked people tell lies. As Christians, we're going to avoid falling away by avoiding weaknesses, wickedness. And that includes, we're going to make sure we are telling the truth at all times. 
as we conclude this morning, how are you living your Christian life? To those that have never become Christians, the Lord is pulling for you, and we are too as well here at Hickory Knoll. And we want you to become a Christian for the very first time and begin living today faithful to God as you repent of those sins and, and confess your faith and are baptized into Christ. But to those of you who are faithful Christians, let's remind ourselves and be encouraged as we look at these verses this morning to make sure that we do not fall back into sin and end up falling away from the Lord. Let's stay away from that stuff that we left and make sure we don't ever go back to it. And third, this morning, as you may be here and you may be a Christian, but yes, you're here, but you know you have fallen away from the Lord. We hope, as Larry prayed this morning, that you will turn from those strayful ways and that you will repent of those sins and you will come back to the Lord by asking him to forgive you of those sins. The Bible is very clear on what we need to do in order to make sure that we are Christians. The idea of once saved, always saved is not true. That as Christians, we can fall away. But the good news is we know exactly what we need to do to make sure we stay faithful to God. We worship. We have wisdom. We walk towards God. And we avoid wickedness in our lives. If we can help you in any way this morning, will you come forward while we stand and while we sing together? <laughs>